listeners, welcome to another episode of The Book Table by Backroom Whispering. Today we'll be discussing the evolution of fantasy literature and some of our favorite eras. I'm Dorothy, and I'll be moderating this episode. Let's have everybody go around and say your name and your favorite style or era of fantasy. Alright, I uh, will start. My name is Rebecca, and my favorite style of fantasy is definitely adapted fairy tales. Um, so fantasy that is kind of a new usually modern and interesting take on a fairy tale. Hi guys, um, I'm Aki, and my favorite style of fantasy is um, epic or high fantasy, and uh, not just like the traditional type, but like I definitely like authors who are trying to do new things with epic fantasy and move it away from the same good versus evil dark lords trying to take over the world tropes, but still keep it in that like box. Hello, everybody. I'm Madeleine. Um, I don't actually have a particularly favorite kind of fantasy. I'm kind of a jack-of-all-trades, master-of-none. I like them all fairly equally, so I don't have anything that I like more than anything else. Okay, awesome. Uh, As for myself, I think that I prefer the most modern style there is, so like 80s onward. Um, I do love me some strong female protagonists, and that doesn't seem to have been such a theme in the earlier eras. Um, So I would say modern fantasy, urban fantasy, um, YA fantasy as well. Just so we're all on the same page, I pulled a couple definitions of Merriam-Webster that we can reference during this conversation. So for fantasy, I have imaginative fiction featuring especially strange settings and grotesque characters. For mythology, I have a body of myths, the myths dealing with gods, demigods, and legendary heroes of a particular people. For legend, I have a story coming down from the past, especially one popularly regarded as historical, although not verifiable. And for fairy tale, I have a story, as for children, involving fantastic forces and beings, as fairies, wizards, and goblins, or a story in which improbable events lead to a happy ending. All right, so our first discussion question is, how do you personally define fantasy literature? Wikipedia seemed to include fairy tales on the page History of Fantasy, and we wondered if mythology would be considered or not. So... Thinking about the definitions that we're using today, where do you guys draw the line? Honestly, I have always thought of fantasy as just any kind of literature that deals with things outside the norm. So as soon as you get like non-human characters or the introduction of magic or things that would never happen in real life, because they can't usually, um, I consider that fantasy. Although I find the question of mythology interesting because I think a lot of fantasy take stuff from mythology and when we look back from like a modern western perspective at something like greek mythology we would say yeah that's pretty fantastical we have non-human creatures there's these elements of the supernatural and everyday life etc um but at the same time people i don't think would classify like the bible as fantasy and so i think it's sort of disingenuous to look at mythologies um, from cultures that even if they're not necessarily practiced in the modern world and just to say yeah that counts as fantasy because then we would have to say that anything that is still practiced that includes those sort of magical or supernatural elements is also fantasy and I don't think people would say that so I would say probably fantasy for me is things that include unusual or impossible elements that are not intended in a religious context. So I think I would say mythology is a no on the fantasy. I agree with uh, Rebecca, and my definition of fantasy is um, very uh, genre-specific. I see it as a literary genre that arose in the last century, and nothing more than that. Even though the word fantasy in English has a very expansive meaning, it means imagination or magic or or whatever, but um, in my case, I like to have this very narrow definition because, as Rebecca pointed out, um, mythology was real for people and is still real for many people even today. So I wouldn't want to even put fairy tale in that category because a lot of people definitely believe that they were ogres or whatever in forests back in the Middle Ages. So so I think it's uh, very important to recognize fantasy as a specific genre, and I the thing that I think also separates it, and I think this is the most important part from 
um, mythology or other things like from the past is the people who are making fantasy, these authors, um, they know what they're doing. They, they're they deliberately creating something that they think is not real and is a story or a world for readers. But um, people who made up myths or made up stories back in the day, I don't think they necessarily um, consciously believe that they were creating uh, what they would consider to be false things. Um, they saw a natural phenomenon and then they interpreted it as such. So I think there's a um, there's a matter of intention we need to consider. Aki, I was wondering if you would elaborate on why you said within the last century. Um, I, I, I think that's an interesting cutoff and I would like to see where it came from. It, it's, I, I, I would say, it comes from, I suppose, my reading of history, which um, I admit in this particular case is not the most detailed or strongest reading, and, and I can't go into people's heads and tell you what they thought. But it seems to me that people, for example, when um, Mallory wrote um, um, Le Morte Arthur in like the 15th century, I don't think he deliberately thought he was making up everything. I think he actually believed that maybe five, six centuries before him, King Arthur and his knights are actually riding around England and doing the deeds that he said they were doing. And maybe he elaborated or exaggerated a bit here and there, but I don't think he thought that at its like at its core that he was um, telling a false story. But once we get the modern novel in like the 19th century, and you have like Frankenstein and Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde and so on and so forth, these authors were consciously making up stories. They weren't actually thinking or expecting their readers to believe that they were recounting some like something they heard happen a hundred years before. So I think there is um, a connection between the rise of the modern novel and this um, suspension of uh, disbelief among readers that you get. I was just going to say that I guess I get to be the one person who heavily disagrees with most of what was just said on both points. Uh, for me, with fantasy, it's a fiction, usually with an element of the strange or the impossible. And I think because I look at mythological and religious texts, including things like the Bible, as subsets of fiction, and it's probably because I'm an atheist agnostic, I don't believe in any sort of divine power, to me that falls into the paranormal and the element of the, for me, impossible. So I look at mythology and legends and fairy tales and the Bible, the Torah, the Quran, I mean, anything like that. I look at it as a kind of fiction. So I do consider those fantasy novels. And as for Aki, I wanted to note on something you said, you were talking about with mythology that there wasn't the intent of, I think, writing the story um, as anything more than trying to explain natural phenomena. I have to disagree in the case of a very particular mythological text, which is the Epic of the Aeneid that was written by Virgil in ancient Rome, which is very clearly, despite being a kind of cornerstone of Roman mythology, is a piece of propagandist fiction. It's there to legitimize the claim of Augustus Caesar to the throne. And so I, while I find your perspective interesting, I do have to disagree with it on that point. And then also, I think it's interesting that you find the cutoff to be just the past century when you have things that were written in like the 1700s, like the Castle of Otranto by Walpole, which while it's considered Gothic fiction, certainly has a lot of elements of the paranormal and the fantastical. And then also fairy tales like the Nutcracker and the Mouse King. I mean, that's the very early 1800s, if I recall it correctly. So I don't know, perhaps for me, I have a much broader view of what fantasy is because I also view mythological texts as fantasy. Um, regarding my century comments, I guess I was speaking loosely. Um, I, I mean to say that once the Enlightenment and people began thinking about these things more rationally, what, whatever date you want to put to it. So okay. don't hold me too closely. <laughs> Yeah, sorry. When you said the past century, I'm like, wait, are we cutting out the 1800s and the 1700s? Because there was definitely stuff in there. I'm confused. But I do want to talk about your point about uh, the Aeneid. Um, yeah, I, I do know that it was somewhat deliberately written, but I don't think we can deny the fact that most contemporaries of uh, Virgil, or maybe he himself, did at least believe that there was once a place called Troy, and it got destroyed, and these things happened. Like, it wasn't a, myth a mythical thing to them. Like, they were just retelling something that they thought to be 
village is fact, or would you disagree with that? Um, I'd only disagree because the destruction of Troy is only one out of 12 books of the Aeneid. It's literally only book two. Um, it is by far the most famous part of it, but it's only one small part of it. The rest of it is completely divorced from that story of Troy. And most of it is spent in trying to legitimize Augustus as a descendant of Aeneid. So, I'm sorry, not Aeneid, Aeneas, the hero of the Aeneid. Uh, so, for me, there is a larger element of political cunning than there is an element of I'm saying that I genuine believe, genuinely believe what I'm writing. So, um, I actually have a question that's related to the disagreement about whether religious literature counts as fantasy, um, which is just thinking about author intent and whether that matters when you are classifying a genre or classifying a particular work in a genre. So this kind of, this comes up a lot in art um, when you're thinking about classifying art as whether like, what was it intended to be versus how is it received? And so I think from my perspective, I'm thinking about intention of author and that religious works are not intended to talk about something that's impossible or when they are, it's the impossible that actually exists, if that makes sense. This is a heavy religious theory that I don't want to get into. But um, but I feel like what you're saying, Matt, is that you're saying no fantasy literature is anything that sort of deals with this impossible, um, whether or not the authors believe it to be possible. So I don't know if you can uh, expand on that a little bit about how we even classify something as a genre. Like, is that done from the outside or does author intent matter or, you know, where is the line drawn there? No. Yeah. That's a great question for me. I think because I look at it from such a personal perspective and that I, I have a tendency to ignore authorial intent as to whether or not they believed what they were writing. And I prefer to have the much broader definition of fantasy just being fiction that I find particularly imaginative with an element of the impossible. Um, so I, I guess, no, I don't really consider authorial intent because I'm not personally trying to speak for the author. I'm just speaking for the way that I view fantasy. Okay, so a lot of things to think about here. Um, and I agree with the fact that Matt said earlier that it was a very broad question, just the word fantasy. So we're going to narrow it down a little bit more. Um, we're going to say classical fantasy and modern fantasy. What books or series do you guys consider the beginning of those eras or representative of those eras? Um, I'm going to go ahead and not dip my toes into the beginning question because I have a feeling that Aki and Mad um, will have more to say about that and probably more knowledge to base what they're saying on that. But when I think about Hallmark, hallmarks of classic fantasy, I definitely think about like Lord of the Rings. Um, basically, you're basic epic as Aki mentioned earlier that is good versus evil evil's trying to take over the world good hero on a quest to save the world um and then modern fantasy i think is a somewhat more complicated genre where authors play a little bit more with that and sometimes it's not so obvious who's evil and who's good and you have flawed heroes that sometimes do really terrible things um, every once in a while you even get a modern fantasy from the perspective of someone who really is the antagonist, um, and sometimes they find redemption and sometimes they don't. So I think that's sort of the biggest split, I think, between modern and classical is that classical fantasy is very much good versus evil, you want the good to win, and modern fantasy really blurs those lines a lot more. All right, so um, I'll go next because I know uh, Mad will have much to say to disagree with the definition that at least I'm going to say that for me classical fantasy also begins in the 1950s or maybe at the most the 30s or the 40s and I know you can argue that there are many many works of um, literature and fiction from the 18th and 19th century or even before that um, could be said to be works of fantasy or precursors but at least from the specific perspective of the genre that I think we're talking about uh, we really have to talk about Tolkien and before and after Tolkien because um, I don't think we would have anything without Tolkien. We would just have a continuation of 19th century horror stories or, or whatever that take place mostly on Earth. And once in a while, you might slip into the rabbit hole and go somewhere else. But the idea that you could build your entire world from scratch and situate your fantasy there 
is something that I think is definitely um, would not have caught on if the Lord of the Rings wouldn't have been successful. So I think what we have a era of classical fantasy from about the 50s to the 90s, which I'd say more or less followed that template that Rebecca mentioned, good and evil, um, usually usually a new world, but sometimes you would also have the Earth and you would have people coming from the Earth and going to some other world or whatnot. And um, there's a lack of complexity and that in story and also a lack of strong female characters until about the 90s. But then I think things changed in the 90s because authors came in and began to incorporate a lot from what they knew about other aspects of life, like history or geography. And in, in a way, I think fantasy became more, quote unquote, realistic, if that is the right term to use when talking about fantasy, because the world became more full of life and um, full of people actually acting like people and you know, good and evil became more blurry and so on and so forth. So that's how I would separate classical and modern fantasy. And yes, I'm going to disagree with both of those. Um, <laughs> I think this, again, ties back to the past question that I do consider mythology some form of fantasy. So classical fantasy, for me, ties very heavily into a lot of my own study into narratology, especially the work of like Joseph Campbell. Joseph Campbell, for those of you who are unfamiliar, is really famous for a book called The Hero with a Thousand Faces, and he uh, put forth an idea that's called the monomyth, which is just another fancy title for the hero's journey. Uh, and the hero's journey, bare bones description, is hero goes on an adventure and in some sort of decisive crisis or crucible, winds of victory, comes home, changed or transformed. What Campbell did with that in terms of the monomyth was argue that effectually humanity has been telling variations of the hero's journey since storytelling became a thing. So for me, that means I do go back to all the mythology and I look at things like Gilgamesh, the Iliad, the Odyssey, Beowulf, everything like that. I consider that classical fantasy. My idea of modern fantasy is also far earlier than um, what either Aki or Rebecca said in that I know the advent of the modern novel is kind of traditionally considered around, I think it's 1605 with Don Quixote, but Modern fantasy for me, again, begins somewhere in the 18th century, maybe the 19th. Um, I'm looking at anything from Wagner's Der Ring, Destiny by Longes, which I probably just mispronounced because it's German and I don't know German. Um, McDonald's, The Princess and the Goblin, any of the things that I mentioned beforehand, such as uh, Castle of Otranto and The Nutcracker. And you have another work by, Al by McDonald's called The Fantastes. And then also, especially for me, I look at Edgar Rice Burroughs' Barsoom series, which, listeners, if you don't know, uh, that was the inspiration for Disney's rather disastrous John Carter film. And that's considered, it's called something like Sword in Space. It's, it's some subset of space fantasy. And that's where I start really seeing modern fantasy becoming a thing. I do not particularly look at Tolkien as some sort of cornerstone of fantasy, mainly because I find that he appropriated so much of the Ring of the Nibelung from Wagner that I can't find him all that original. So yeah, classical fantasy is sort of everything prior to right around the 17, 1800s for me. But I will say what Rebecca had noted, and I think what Aki had uh, noted was sort of the post-Tolkien uh, and again, what Rebecca was saying with more recent works of fantasy, for me, I almost call that kind of like a postmodern fantasy. So fantasy sort of has three little realms for me. I don't really have a good start for where I start considering postmodern fantasy, but I do acknowledge that a lot of the most recent works of fantasy, especially things like A Song of Ice and Fire and everything in that wake, has been different than a lot of the fantasy that came before it. And listeners, we will definitely be getting a recommended reading list from all of our participants today that will be included in the blog post, so don't worry if your pen ran out of ink with all of those titles. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> so I, I see where you, I see where Mad's coming from, but putting aside the literary content of the work, from I guess a marketing perspective, you have to agree that something did happen with The Lord of the Rings that changed the way the the publishing industry and the genre, like everyone like began to approach fantasy. Would you agree with that? Yes, I would agree that Tolkien is very important for mainstreaming fantasy and making it easier to market. 
Uh, but I try to tend to separate marketing from content, I suppose. I, I don't have a better word for that. Because as we know, marketing can be very misleading. Listeners, if you recall our Ember in the Ashes episode, we had a lot of issues, especially on my side, with marketing being very misleading as to the type of book I was getting. Yeah, and I also think it's interesting just to think about the history of literacy and access to literature and printing presses and publishing um, and how when you get to sort of the Tolkien era, more people are reading, more people are reading for pleasure, books are easier to produce. And so it sort of makes sense in a way that that's where when Tolkien writes his epic trilogy that, you know, is based off something before it, but it is accessible in a way that a lot of things weren't previously. And I do think that that matters, um, even if it is just for publication and Tolkien made fantasy mainstream because he could and because he kind of appeared in this perfect sort of mix of history and where publishing was going and people are reading and all of that. Um, but that's why I say he's a hallmark what I consider classic fantasy, even if classic fantasy might go way before him, more people know Tolkien than, you know, a lot of the other things that, Matt, you had mentioned. Um, so that's my sort of defense and why I would consider Tolkien the hallmark of classic fantasy, even if he doesn't begin it. Um, but I did want to say I'm thankful that people have mentioned Game of Thrones because I meant to list that as a hallmark of modern fantasy where you get you know, that's a good one where you have antagonists as point of view characters and you don't really know, you know, who you're cheering for in the end because everyone is a really complex, often kind of terrible person. Um, so that I think is like a super hallmark of modern fantasy. And again, I think it's hallmark because it's so popular. Um, so even if it's not necessarily original, it's people know it so you can point to it and say that's what modern fantasy is. Although I would say that I agree with you from a literary point of view. Um, if we, I guess if we take Matt's definition as including mythology, then everyone knew the myths back in the day. It, it, it could also almost be argued that if, if we include mythology and fantasy together as one thing, this might be the most popular genre like in the history of humanity because people just love like myths and stories with magic and fairy tales and and it just seems to be that if our earliest literature, like Gilgamesh, is quote unquote fantasy, then you know that it might be like something inherent in um, humanity's condition that they always need to have some sort of fantasy, whether it's through word of mouth or literature or something. And so it will always be a popular genre. And the fact that it wasn't for maybe a part of the 20th century is the aberration, not the pattern. Okay. Awesome. Let's move on to our next question, which is, do you think your opinion is influenced by the fantasy stories, books, series, movies, whatever, that you were exposed to growing up? And what was your earliest experience with fantasy? I have the strangest feeling that we're about to get three very different answers. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> um, I would say yes. Certainly my exposure to fantasy has shaped the way I think of the fantasy genre. Um, and I was raised by a father who is really, really, really into the what I consider the classic slash classical fantasy style in that you have good versus evil, hero's journey, epic f high fantasy sort of things. Um, and my first fantasy was actually Narnia, or, oh, potentially The Princess Bride. I actually don't remember which one was read to me first, um, but my father read to my brother and I as children, and he read a lot of that sort of classical fantasy. So we got The Lord of the Rings, The Hobbit, Narnia, all of that, which I think is why when I was a teenager and I encountered the sort of more modern fantasy, so you get um, into some urban fantasy, Holly Black's uh, Tithe trilogy, which is very dark with very complex characters. I was like super into it because it was really, really different for me um, and really sort of out there. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I guess until I was older and had studied a little more about literature, I 
wouldn't have known that there was really anything sort of previous to the Narnia Lord of the Rings era because that's what I was exposed to. Um, so I think that that maybe answers the question. I don't know. Let me know if there's anything else I'm supposed to be saying. Sounded good to me. Um, for me, uh, I think at least the first few series I read were back in the fourth and fifth grade. And there's some of the standard series, such as the Chronicles of Pardrain and Narnia and then Harry Potter. But even before then, I was exposed to mythology and fairy tales. Um, growing up, I did watch and read a lot about both Hindu and Greek mythology. And I remember an offhand comment that my dad once made when we first made him watch Lord of the Rings. He's like, he said that he thought it very closely resembled like the Indian epics and it wasn't all that different. So maybe, so maybe I guess from one perspective, I was exposed to fantasy from the time I was like a little kid, but and specific genre of fantasy, I started around the age of eight or nine. And um, initially, I just read it because one of my teachers in elementary school thought I should read more fiction because I had a tendency to only read nonfiction. And unfortunately, I don't think that pattern ever like went away. But I did begin reading fantasy, at least among fictional books. And I, I, I like reading fantasy a lot because it is the only fiction I usually read other than some of the classics. And, and I don't really care much for reading genres like romance or adventure that takes place in modern New York City or something because I feel like that's like real life. And if I want to read fiction and have something different, I don't need to read about New York City. I need to escape or, or go to a place where at least someone's like doing something creative and you get interesting world building or the like. So for me, fantasy hasn't really always been about the magic, really. It's just been about being in a different place that isn't like in the modern world or in the current world. And it's always been more about world building and having interesting races or new languages or whatever and whatnot. And definitely um, it's always been there kind of to be the opposite to my other reading interests because my other reading interests in real life are history and things that are more dry and cut. Huh. Hey, Aki, I just was curious, what about um, urban fantasy? Unless I just sort of missed the back half of what you were just saying. I'm curious as to what your thoughts are then of urban fantasy, because that sort of takes the fantastical creative elements, but then would throw it in, say, modern New York City. Uh, yeah, I don't think, so I don't, I don't like science fiction that much either. And I think that's also because we have a modern, um, ultra-modern setting. I mean, I do like some stories like Star Wars or whatever, but... Um, I say for me, the line that I would draw is probably towards the end of steampunk when you enter the modern era. Uh, I haven't read much urban fantasy per se. I've skimmed one or two books, but I don't think me personally, like from watching superhero movies, which I guess kind of fit in that category. Um, I don't think, I mean, I don't, I don't dislike it, but I, it's not something I seek out on my own, like eagerly. Because then, again, you lose the element of escape. And even if you do have people doing magical things, flying around or whatever, you have a you know social structure or whatever that's very identifiable with, with current times. And there's also a part of that, like, you want to escape when you read fantasy. You want to escape, you know, things like um, modern relationships so that sort of thing. And I also wonder, I'm just going to hop in here on the urban fantasy conversation, if it might also have to do with um, what we were raised with and the kind of stories that we think about as fantastical and whether that has to do with escape or just association, I don't know. But I know that I also have some trouble with urban fantasy. Um, I, have, I mean, some of my favorite YA series are urban fantasy, like I freaking love Cassandra Clare's Mortal Instruments series, but I do prefer her Infernal Devices, which are more like pre-steampunk, steampunk sort of era, very, very different world. And I think that, to me, fantasy really, like, there is something important about it being in, a, like, almost like a high fantasy, like, in a different world, or a world that's not recognizable or doesn't feel like my world. And so it's interesting that you brought that up, Aki, because I wonder if it's because of the escapism or if it's because I was first introduced to, like, Narnia and Middle Earth and um or what that really is but then i think you know also harry potter is 
an interesting cross of that because it is sort of our world, but also very much not. And what's magical about it is the part that's not our world. Um, so it's just something interesting to th- talk about. I'm really glad that you guys brought that up. Well, I know that as the moderator, I'm not supposed to be all about my opinions, but I like to jump on this urban fantasy uh, conversation because I personally think that urban fantasy is just as much of an escape as something set in a completely different universe. Because me, in the life that I go through every day, I do not live in gritty inner cities St. Louis surrounded by werewolves and vampires and politics and magical witch spells. Like, that's... That's not my life. Um, I guess I also see an escape in more realistic fiction. Um, Like, you know, I'm not a a love-struck teen in Arkansas or whatever. But I definitely think that urban fantasy, sure, it might resemble our world, but just due to the whole fantasy aspect, I think that it definitely gets me transported at least a little bit. So that's my two cents. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I kind of agree with you, Dee. I'm quite a fan of urban fantasy. Um, as I said before at the beginning of this, I'm a bit of a jack-of-all-trades, master of none. I read just about anything and everything, especially within fantasy. Um, as In relation to fantasy stories I was exposed to growing up, um, I was basically inundated with and raised on Greek mythology. My maternal grandfather's a now retired professor of classics. He could recite a lot of, I'm sure, the Iliad and the Odyssey in ancient Greek, and I'm fairly sure he did once or twice to me when I was a kid. I didn't understand a word, but I have fond memories of being told all those stories orally by my grandfather. And since I do consider those fantasy, that would be some of the earliest fantasy I recall being told or reading, particularly as a child, the Dolaire's Book of Greek Myth, and a seminal work of my childhood. Um, Beyond that, some of the earliest memories I have of fantasy it's either Narnia or Harry Potter I can't say for sure which one came first probably because neither of my parents particularly like fantasy um my mom I know had read the Lord of the Rings and had read Narnia and she bought me Harry Potter because she'd been hearing so many great things about it but I'm really the only one in my family who reads a good deal of fantasy and I often have to Uh, lie and play down the fantasy when I try and recommend it to my parents. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. But I think because maybe also I didn't have this massive exposure to fantasy from my immediate family members outside of the mythology from my grandfather, maybe that's why I also really, really like things like urban fantasy, because to me it is sort of an escape, because I was also reading a lot of realistic, quote-unquote, fiction, and any other kind of fiction. But then once you threw in magic into intercity New York, I was like, whoa, this is really different. This is not my life. This is a complete escape. This is not something I'm used to. And oftentimes I was stumbling upon these books randomly. Nobody was recommending them to me. Um, So I would find them particularly escapist, I suppose, in that that regard. And all the more interesting for it, because before then the only fantasy I'd really had was mythology Harry Potter and Narnia and Tolkien, although it took me many tries to read Tolkien as a kid. All right. So away from the personal and back to the philosophical again, do you guys see a shift in modern fantasy from more classical fantasy like Tolkien? Where do you think the genre is going? Don't all talk at once, guys. Oh, snap. I'm so (laughs) sorry. I got this. I got this. Okay. Um, Yeah, I definitely see a shift. um, As I have mentioned a couple of times, I think one of the biggest shifts is in characterization um, and sort of the framing of the story. I think modern fantasy, all it really takes for it to be considered fantasy is that it either takes place in a different world or takes place in our world with things that are not our world. Um, So this is like urban fantasy when you introduce magical elements, certain non-human creatures, um, things like that. And so I think there was a shift. I think a key brought up earlier in the 90s um, was a big one where you start getting this whole body of literature where you have female protagonists of fantasy, which was not much of a thing before um, in both adult fantasy and YA fantasy. And so I think 
And I don't know if other people might have better examples, but when I think of the books that I own that are from the 90s that are fantasy, and I would consider more modern fantasy because you have the more complicated characters and it's not necessarily good versus evil. It could be very personal stories. Like I said earlier, my favorite kind is fairy tale adaptations. So um, I'm thinking specifically of like Juliet Marlier's fantasy works, which all have female protagonists and most are based on different cultures, fairy tales. And then she, it's not like makes it more real. There's certainly magic and such involved, but she sort of brings them to the real world in a way that they aren't in their original form. Um, And then you get this sort of shift, I think, after that, which is to the more like, you could have your evil character be your main character and you're sort of telling their story. And I think it becomes a lot more character driven and a lot less overall plot driven. Um, It's much less about we're going to have good versus evil in this huge world battle and we want good to win. You could have stories that are literally just this person exists in this world and here's their story. So I think Yes, character is a big thing, and I think that that's where it's going more and more every day. You get your Game of Thrones, which is really just kind of a character study of a world. Um, At least in my opinion, it's just a really interesting, like, different people's perspectives in this really, like, interesting fantasy world. And I think that that is becoming more and more and more of a thing, and that's where I see the genre going is very, very character-centered. We're just looking through this person's perspective at this non-real world. Yeah, um, I mostly agree with what Rebecca said, and I would like to add on to the whole um, the culture thing. I definitely, in the beginning, when you had, like, Tolkien and everything, um, you kind of didn't really feel that um, the cultures, other than, like, the main good guy cultures, like the Hobbits or Gondor or Rohan, were, like, really real. Like, they seemed, they seemed very, um, like, crude. Like, when you think about the people of, like, the Haradrim, who were, like, the men who live south of Mordor and apparently represented Africa or something and, and whatnot, and they were just kind of, like, these black and white cartoon figures that Tolkien kind of created to, you know, be the minions of the dark lord and you don't get that anymore in modern fantasy like everyone has everyone has like a story and everyone has like complexity and to someone who's not white and who likes fantasy a lot i think that's something that really matters a lot to me in particular because it it shows that you can draw on um non-european cultures and non-european mythology and still you know treat um other you know, other cultures with respect and, like, people who represent these other cultures in fantasy with respect. For example, in um, um, George R. R. Martin, um, I, I wouldn't say he does the best job of doing it, but at least when he shows us the Dothraki or the people of Karth, he tries to, like, add a complexity and a depth to the characters there and, like, explain why their culture is the way it is. Um, in a way that I don't think Tolkien would have done so. I think there's a lot more to be done, though, in that case, because, for example, when you think about Slaver's Bay in in um, Song of Ice and Fire, you get this really disgusting culture still where they have slavery and they treat their kids poorly and um, it's just really decadent and everything. And I don't think um, George R. R. Martin could get away with that if he was writing about a Western culture like Westeros in a similar way. So there is still work to be done, but I think that's one of the things the genre is definitely changing about. And it would help though, if the genre was more global, as far as I can tell, the majority of fantasy authors live in the United States or Great Britain or an English speaking country. So their audience and their set of inspiration is still kind of narrow. And yeah, maybe there is fantasy going on in other places, but it's not widely translated or whatnot. Um, I'm sure there's, I mean, I've seen anime that could be considered fantasy, so I'm sure there are people with ideas similar to fantasy in other places. But at the moment, Western fantasy literature is an English-speaking thing. Yeah, I absolutely agree with um, 
a lot of the things that Aki and Rebecca just said, especially in terms of the complexity of characters, as something that I have also noticed being a definite shift in more recent works of fantasy. And I, I love how Rebecca pointed out it, it's you can have your villain or person of highly questionable morals be your protagonist. Uh, Song of Ice and Fire is a great example of that. Um, another thing that I've noticed, and I'm probably going to try to explain this in a poor manner, um, uh, the shift that I've noticed in a lot of more modern fantasy works is, as I say, it's getting uh, grittier and kind of, for lack of a better word, almost like dirtier. There's a sharpness and a bite to much of the stuff being put out, um, especially things like A Song of Ice and Fire, um, or like the First Law trilogy by Joe Abercrombie and many others that I think um, is where you see this shift best. I think of it a lot because I was a film major. Film genres develop in a very similar way. They shift with their audience, usually maturing as the audience grows used to and potentially eventually tired of tropes and simplicity, which, while they were once new, are now kind of considered stale. And I think that's sort of what's happening in the fantasy genre right now. Authors are realizing that audience are very familiar with a lot of the tropes that we've been seeing for X number of years. And I think also authors aren't shying away from being very downright explicit in a lot of their content, not to at all imply that there's no longer any subtlety or the likes in the genre, but I think it's almost like authors are more liberated in what they're writing about. For example, we're going to be talking about Shadow Shaper, which is a piece of urban fantasy, and you have incredibly body positive protagonists and a culture that you don't normally see inside of urban fantasy, which I believe the is Hispanic or um, in the case of another young adult series, you have the wrath and the dawn, which is dealing with uh, Arabia. But yes, I think there is definitely a shift in more recent works of fantasy in the expansion of the various cultures that are being utilized and how well they're being treated that a lot of the content is getting more explicit uh, for lack of another better word, more adult, I guess, and that characters are becoming all the more complex. They don't have to be always good, always bad. We can have characters like Jamie Lannister, who does a lot of things we really don't like, but he's still kind of interesting to read about in A Song of Ice and Fire and makes me highly question my morals because I find him so interesting and sometimes I want good things to happen to him. Um, so, yeah. Considering explicitness or risqueness, for lack of a better word, I'd just like to do a quick throwback to our last episode about sex and fantasy. We had talked about how C Tolkien um, really never had any sexual violence at all for the fact that people were being killed and there were massive armies fighting each other to death. But then you have Harry Potter. Okay, it's not sex, but you do have characters being tortured and they're young kids being tortured. And that might not be something that was considered okay to write a book about even as recently as the 50s. Um, even if it's not explicit language being used, it's just the content level is very different. So if you're interested in exploring more in that direction and haven't heard our episode about sex and fantasy, it's on SoundCloud, YouTube, and iTunes. I agree with Matt that we have more grittiness in fantasy, but I think we should be careful of um, going too far with that, just like it was not realistic to have um, like a Tolkien-esque world where there was no grittiness and no sex and the good worse evil worldview. Um, not not everyone in every error is always getting killed in the most sadistic way possible or or whatnot, as some modern fantasy would like to have us also um, believe. So I, I just think that. Um, maybe modern fantasy is overplaying that a bit now, and maybe it should focus on telling uh, a good story that's also realistic, but not not one where every other character needs to die, like in the most horrible way possible. Can you bring that up with my friend George R. R. Martin? <laughs> <laughs> Kill everyone. That's a, that's a, oh my gosh, speaking of that. That's a joke my mom made when I, I had her watching the show. She could never read the books. I, I wouldn't even want her to try. But watching the show, she would get very distressed as characters would get killed off, especially in the first season. She would 
literally devolve into profanity. And it was hysterical for me to witness. But she turned at, we mom at one point and said, you know what I think? I think when George R.R. R. Martin gets bored with a character, he just decides to kill them off. Nope, I'm not going to write them a continuing story anymore. I'm just going to ax them. <laughs> but but what you were saying, Aki, I do think it's important that there is believability and that grittiness for the sake of grittiness, I think, is definitely a problem. And, it, and you do have uh, some times where people go too far in one direction in reaction to not wanting to be too safe or saying, oh, people are being super gritty. That's the thing. Let me ump that to the 20th degree and... Yeah, that'll be awesome. It's like, well, no. Ember in the ashes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, an ember in the ashes and preposterone. It's just not good. <laughs> um, thank you, Stephen, for coining that term in the Storm Dancer episode. Um, but I do think it's true that sometimes authors will just overdo it on the grittiness. Believability is very important. Like, I, I love me some really, really good gritty fantasy, but even I can admit when it's done very poorly and when you overdo it and then it's not believable anymore it's just irritating all right so we've talked about a lot of different types of fantasy today um i would just like to wrap up the podcast with one of my favorite questions that i thought of for this discussion uh which involves the series star wars as you all know star wars is set in space so it's very easy to just stick it in the sci-fi box but i would argue that the force is essentially magic and that it shares a lot a lot a lot of similarities with many of the fantasy um, media that we've been discussing today. So do you guys have any thoughts on that? Yeah, so um, I think that my gut reaction says space, ergo sci-fi, but when I actually sit down to think about it, I do I agree with you, Dorothy, that I think it might actually fit better in a fantasy category, um, partially because force, magic, and especially the force having the light side and the dark side. And so this kind of echoes the classical fantasy, good versus evil, constantly in battle with each other. And there's this like external good and external evil that are somehow um, essentially fighting for control of the world. And then you have a hero character who is good and uses the good to defeat the evil. And that's essentially the Star Wars story, um, which also takes place in the past, which is unusual for sci-fi, um, you know, a long, long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. So it is a really interesting case. Um, and I think, in my humble opinion, probably fantasy, even though it sort of looks like it's in a sci-fi package. And so I'm interested in what other people have to say about that. I don't think you can really draw like too thick a line between sci-fi and fantasy anyway. Um, e even if Star Wars happened to have, like, let's say it was set in the future, like, and you would expect it to be set in the future. The only reason we don't think so is because it says it was set in the past, but you know what I mean. Most sci-fi is assumed to be set in the future. And I don't, I, I don't really see where you can really draw that line at all because some things I used to think were pure fantasy, like um, Brandon Sanderson's books. Um, the more you learn about that universe, then you find out like they're all on different planets, and there's like a whole cosmere and everything. It starts to look more like science fiction. So I don't see, I don't really see a, a clearly definable line between the two. I, I think that's a matter of debate for a future podcast. But I will say that. Um, at the very least, sci-fi is probably a sub-branch of fantasy. Yeah, Star Wars is interesting because I, I like what you're saying, Aki, in that it, it's sometimes very hard to draw the line between science fiction and fantasy because there is actually science fantasy, which is this sort of mixed genre. It's this umbrella term for things that have elements from both science fiction and fantasy. And as much as I would kind of like to put Star Wars in there and you have things like The Forest and again long long time ago and all those other things that Rebecca brought up for me I think it's just because I really do see Star Wars as a space opera and since space opera tends to have its roots in like the western genre and oftentimes I think it's also has the tradition of like the naval adventure I think sort of master and commander but for, for Star Wars I, I really look at the western genre um and the difference, I think, between, like, a space opera, which is what I'm sort of putting Star Wars under, and something like science fantasy is 
the focus of the two, whereas space opera emphasizes kind of space warfare and melodramatic adventure, whereas the science fantasy has a couple of offshoots. We tend to lump, I think, post-apocalypse, planetary romance, sword and planet stuff in there. But it doesn't really have that focus on the space warfare or oftentimes the melodrama adventure. So I'll admit there is a... It's hard because when you look at Star Wars, there's this disconnect between the original trilogy and the prequel trilogy, which you don't even have to know that much about Star Wars to know that fans either love or hate the prequel trilogy, because it is so different from what had been done in the originals. So despite the kind of tonal disconnect between the two, where the prequel trilogy, I think, is a lot more of that magic, which would make me want to call it almost fantasy, um, despite all of that, I think I still consider it a space opera, and I do look at it more as kind of science fiction, though I will freely admit Star Wars is a tough one to call, because it does have a lot of elements of fantasy. And I'm I'm not entirely sure sometimes. I could make a case for both. So I, for one, think that that would be an interesting topic for us to continue at some point in the future about the Venn diagram of sci-fi and fantasy, because there are, of course, a lot more works that we could put in that overlap. Um, but we're coming to the end of this episode. And listeners, as I said, we will get a recommended reading list from each of the participants that will be available on our website. Do you guys have any other comments to make about the evolution of fantasy before we say goodbye for the night? While we covered the basics of uh, fantasy and the general evolution of the genre um, over time, uh, we would like to tell you guys more about the detailed history of the modern fantasy genre and what exactly happened in which order, especially after Tolkien. And this includes the uh, commercial viability of the genre when um, the Soda Shannara became the first best-selling fantasy book after Tolkien in 1977, and then The Wheel of Time came along, and then after that, Harry Potter came along. And so um, we'll tell you more about all of that in detail in a future blog post that we will write up for you, and please look forward to that. Awesome. Rebecca, Mad, any comments? I would just like to say, as always, if you have thoughts or questions or you want to hear anything else, please interact with our Twitter, Facebook, website to let us know what you're thinking, whether you agree with us or disagree, or if you want to hear more, if you want us to write a specific blog post or do another episode about anything that's related, we always want to know what you want to hear. So please, please, please communicate. Yes, exactly to what Rebecca said. Please communicate with us, especially because, as you could see, even in this podcast, we didn't agree with each other, and it's always wonderful to hear other people's opinions and how they view this particular genre that we all love. And also speaking of blog posts, I will be writing one to companion this episode, though fair warning, it's going to be about Tolkien and it might not be very nice. But that's part of the fun, is that everybody's got different opinions and we all like to hear everyone's different opinions. All right, so listeners, thanks for listening. Participants, thanks for participating and we all look forward to those blog posts for now. See you next time on The Book Table from Backroom Whispering. Bye! Today's podcast is brought to you by Audible. Get a free audiobook download and 30-day free trial by going to audibletrial.com slash thebooktable. The Book Table is a podcast from Backroom Whispering Productions. Our theme music is by Mark Wayne. If you like this podcast, rate us on iTunes. Or get in touch with us on Twitter at Backroom Whisper, on Facebook at facebook.com slash backroomwhispering, or by email backroomwhispering at gmail.com. Tune in again next time!